Who fact checks the fact checkers? Whatever you do, don't ask Mariana Spring to do it. Spring, to those unaware of her work, is the BBC's disinformation and social media correspondent. She's been showered with awards, broadsheet profiles, and glossy photo shoots in recent years for her journalistic stand against online lies and conspiracy theories. But earlier this month, an embarrassing story from her past surfaced in the British media. It seems that the BBC's fact checker in chief can't even be trusted to produce a relatively factual CV. According to the New European newspaper, a few years ago, Spring tried and failed to lie her way into a journalism job. While applying for a role based in Moscow with a US news site called Coda Story, Spring allegedly claimed to have worked closely with then BBC Russia correspondent Sarah Rainsford. In truth, she had never worked with Rainsford at all. In correspondence seen by the New European, Coda Story editor in chief Natalia Antilava first checked with the BBC and then confronted Spring who fessed up on the spot. Neither Spring nor the corporation has commented on the story. So, the BBC's disinformation correspondent tried to disinfo her way into a job. Delicious irony doesn't quite cut it. I wonder if BBC Verify, the Beeb's fancy new fact-checking division, is now combing through Spring's old job application, just in case. Now, everyone makes mistakes. A strong propensity for lying is hardly an ideal or encouraging quality in a journalist, by more than willing to give Spring the benefits of the doubt, to take as read that this was one blunder, learned from and never repeated. But there is a reason that BBC sceptical sections of social media erupted with wry amusement when this embarrassing revelation was published. Spring has become, for many, the embodiment of a media elite that constantly rails against our supposedly post-truth age, while spreading more than its own fair share of horseshit. So, in this video, we thought we'd give you a flavour of the misinformation of Mariana Spring and her BBC colleagues. Falsehoods about the first person about ever has been elected to Congress who support that can have real like world conspiracy harm. theory, a Republican yeah. and a Trump supporter. Harmful coronavirus conspiracy theory. Many of the messages are too offensive to broadcast many times on the damage hate-filled content on Twitter can cause. Spring was appointed as the BBC's first specialist disinformation and social media reporter in March 2020, just as COVID-19 was raging and the world was locking down. Since then, she has fronted various shows and done a string of reports about online misinformation, conspiracy theories and abuse, winning plaudit after plaudit from the great and good while doing so. It's all gotten quite gushy. In a recent profile, The Guardian's Zoe Williams praised Spring's zeal and public spiritedness, even her wardrobe choices. In your crankiest, most contrarian mood, Williams wrote, you would still find it impossible to dislike her. It would be like trying to dislike the lionesses. <laughs> it would be like trying to dislike the lionesses. I dare say some of this adulation has gone to Spring's head. You see, she has a pretty bad case of what you might call journalistic main character syndrome. She uses the first person pronoun with abandon and puts herself and the online flack she gets from conspiratorial nutters at the centre of seemingly every story. I've reported many times on the damage hate-filled content on Twitter can cause. I've been bombarded with it myself. Julie Pacetti from the International Centre for Journalists has been analysing the messages directed at me. We can see um, in April 2021 a massive spike uh, in abuse against you, which was connected to your reporting on COVID-19 disinformation. Indeed, the title of a 2021 BBC Panorama documentary was simply, Why Do You Hate Me? Now, the flourishing of conspiratorial thinking online and offline is a very real and troubling problem. We at Spite have had our fair share of run-ins with these people the sort who claim to be independent thinkers while screaming the same five talking points at you. The problem with the Mariana Springs of this world is that they vastly exaggerate the problem, insisting that huge numbers of ordinary people have fallen prey to these deranged ways of thinking. As she put it to MPs at a House of Commons Select Committee earlier this year, quote, it is really important that people understand that this stuff is certainly not limited to the dark corners of the internet or the fringes, but it affects all of our lives, all of the time. Spring isn't the first person to fearmonger about the threat posed by misinformation. But she has become the figurehead for a moral panic about conspiracy theories that has been rumbling along among our elites for years now. As a consequence of all this, anyone that least bit sceptical of COVID policy or climate policy is now routinely smeared as some kind of Infowars addled lunatic, yelling about how all of the frogs are turning gay. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay! Do you understand that? 
And yet, Spring has been responsible for spreading some pretty outrageous misinformation of her own, and not just on her resume. As part of Spring's recent podcast series, Mariana in Conspiracy Land, apparently we're on first name terms with her now, the BBC commissioned a survey into public attitudes towards conspiracy theories. The results rather improbably suggested that a quarter of Brits believed that COVID was a hoax and that vast numbers of us are attending conspiratorial protests and reading obscure conspiratorial newspapers. Such claims fail the basic sniff test. Were this to be remotely true, millions upon millions of us would be taken to the streets waving placards about Bill Gates, 5G or lizards. But the figures were published by the BBC anyway and reported uncritically by outlets including The Guardian. The survey has since been ripped to shreds by the iPaper's Stuart Ritchie, who says the claims are, quote, 100% false, unquote. He puts the dodgy figures down to a mix of tiny sample sizes, meaning the data were woefully unrepresentative of the public at large, and some poorly worded survey questions which confuse respondents and produce unreliable answers. He says that Spring has so far failed to respond to his concerns. Things like this are precisely why even reasonable people are so irked by Spring and her ilk, by this new generation of misinfo hunting journalists who have just recently cropped up. Because they accuse us, ordinary people, of being easily led conspiracists, while at the same time being blind to the misinformation that they themselves are spreading. Nevertheless, they stand in a pretty long and inglorious tradition. Mainstream journalists have at various points in recent times acted as little more than government mouthpieces. During the Iraq war, they happily parroted Tony Blair's nonsense war propaganda. He said that they would be able to take Baghdad without a bloodbath and that in the end the Iraqis would be celebrating. And on both of those points he has been proved conclusively right and it would be entirely ungracious, uh, even for his critics, not to acknowledge that tonight he stands as a larger man and a stronger Prime Minister as a result. The BBC has also been prone to a string of conspiratorial moral panics that have ruined people's lives. Its behaviour during the UK's VIP paedophile scandal a decade ago, in which various men in public life were wrongly accused of past sex abuse, was a particularly appalling example of this. It all culminated in BBC News broadcasting a police raid on singer Cliff Richards' home and defaming former Tory politician Lord McAlpine, both of which cost the corporation pretty dearly in court. In fact, I'd argue that the BBC's respectable misinformation is infinitely more dangerous than the nonsense circulating on the more tinfoil line sections of the internet. The BBC not only has an enormous audience, it also has enormous influence over the ruling class more broadly. Its own brand of alarmist conspiratorial nonsense passes the Islington dinner party test, if you will. It has consequences, and its crusade against online misinformation and hate has consequences as well. Indeed, the BBC's reporting in this area has long resembled a thinly veiled campaign for online censorship. That is perhaps best summed up by that humiliating clash between BBC tech reporter James Clayton and the new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk, earlier this year. They just, there's not enough people to police this stuff, particularly around, um, particularly around hate speech. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use. I, I, honestly, you I don't, can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only, well, I only well, look well, at hang my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example, not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I then how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been, I've been using, I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen that you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and I, you can't I, give us a single one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, 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 then I, I say, sir, so that you don't know what you're talking about. In her own panorama investigation into Musk's takeover of Twitter, Spring paints a similarly apocalyptic picture of a world full of misinformation and abuse as a result of Musk's attempt to make Twitter a more free speech platform. It wasn't just the misogynists who were back. Conspiracy theorists and other extremists were also allowed to return. Twitter users have been in touch with me about this too. These white supremacists have proliferated. Their hate has burgeoned. I have been receiving a brutal barrage of trolls online. It's awash with fake news. It, it just is. While Spring and her BBC colleagues will often stress that they aren't telling social media companies what to do, that would be a lot more convincing if they weren't constantly suggesting that airtight social media moderation is all that stands between us and civilizational collapse. 
In her own Twitter documentary, Spring didn't even manage to find anyone to talk to who was remotely pro-free speech or remotely concerned about online censorship. Nor did she mention the Twitter files and the shocking revelations about US government officials working with the pre-Musk Twitter to censor dissenting accounts. Twitter's historic decision to ban then US President Donald Trump in January 2021 also received only this brief mention. After Trump supporters stormed the Capitol, he was permanently banned. Twitter said he was inciting violence, but his removal triggered a debate about freedom of speech. Had she bothered to look into that debate a little more closely, Spring would know that censoring hate or misinformation isn't nearly as straightforward a business as she seems to think it is. After all, one person's hate speech is another person's passionately held position. Until quite recently, Twitter's policies considered referring to a person with a penis as a man to be transphobic, hateful conduct, if that man identified as a woman. That is, it compelled people to lie, which you might think is precisely the kind of misinformation that our Mariana claims to be so concerned about. What's more, from the COVID lab leak theory to the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, there have been a string of huge stories in recent years that were dismissed by the media elites as conspiracy theories or foreign disinformation or both, only for those very same outlets to later admit that there might actually be something to them. This is precisely why having a Ministry of Truth, whether it's run by the state or Silicon Valley or the BBC or whoever, is such a terrible idea. Mariana Spring, once trying to lie her way into a job, might not be a big deal in the grand scheme of things. But it is an amusing reminder that when it comes to spreading misinformation, these fact-checking journalists are among the worst and certainly the most influential offenders. More importantly, it's a reminder that those who think that they, or people like them, should have the right to dictate what we can say and do online are about as trustworthy as that old, sexed-up CV of Mariana's. These disinformation correspondents could do with fewer photo shoots and a few more long, hard looks in the mirror.